my name is Don Carson. Welcome to the second half of the Christian Thought Lecture Series held at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in the spring of 1991. In the first part of the series, two distinguished, well-thought-of Christian thinkers gave us their perspective on the roots of evangelicalism and its major turning points in the last 50 years or so. And in addition, they gave us something of their vision for the future and dared to utter also something of their fears. Now adding courage to wisdom, they have graciously agreed to come and answer questions and discuss some of these matters in an informal setting so that they can expose their views a little more clearly than is possible in a formal lecture. This discussion is taking place before an audience of several hundred Trinity students, and we would like all of you to join us in welcoming Drs. Henry and Concert. Carl, both you and Kenneth mentioned the founding of the National Association of Evangelicals in 1942. What was the, the mission, the, the sense of uh, drive in the founding members of that uh, organization? First, it had a doctrinal statement, including a plank on the infallibility of Scripture. In a time when the ecumenical movement sought the unity of the church, one world church, uh, even though it might involve doctrinal dilution. And also the drive was to overcome the hostility of the uh, ecumenical bureaucracies uh, to evangelical Christianity, per se. How much doctrinal unity really existed amongst evangelicals uh, at that period? For example, what were the distinctions between evangelicals and fundamentalists at that point? The word uh, fundamentalist had been used uh, to indicate those who were committed to the fundamentals of Christianity. The word evangelical had been pretty well smeared in the conversation with the intellectual elite, had <clears throat> uh, been smeared in the conversation with the intellectual elite because uh, it, uh, evangelical Christianity involved a commitment to miracle and the uh, ecumenical movement was largely modernist and uh, it regarded miracle as unscientific. So that uh, uh, it was a courageous move on the part of the NAE to use the term evangelical that nobody wanted, and, but it was not, it was not uh, really an alternative to, to fundamentalism, per se, in its basic drive. Then may I ask you, uh, Kenneth, what brought about the division in the terminology? Eventually, those two terms came to mean something different. I think that it came to mean something different in the public mind because there really was a difference. The difference was not in how many of the evangelical doctrines or how much of Orthodox Protestant faith each held because they both were thoroughly Orthodox and held to the basic doctrines of Christian biblical faith. The difference came in the eyes of each side as to what was the most strategic way to place evangelical or fundamentalist efforts. One felt that separating oneself off from any touch of liberalism left a clear image of what one stood for as an evangelical or as a fundamentalist. Whereas if one did not separate oneself off, that clouded the theological issues and made it more difficult to maintain the point that evangelical or fundamentalist faith was not what frequently went by the name Christianity. Now, eventually, this wasn't just a, a question of definition, but something of a cleavage between parties, wasn't it? It was a practical cleavage denoting a strategy on the part of each. Now, what part did the rise of a, a cooperative evangelism espoused especially by Billy Graham 
play in all of this? At first, it accentuated the division because Billy Graham oftentimes would ask those who would not agree with his own convictions to participate as church groups or as leaders or even those joining him on the platform. And many felt that this compromised the Christian faith. I think later on, many saw that this was merely a strategy because there was never any question in the message that Billy Graham and the Billy Graham team set forth as to what they stood for. The, uh, the confusion may have come in that the line of who was included wasn't as clear as many would like. Now, uh, amongst the many features in your lecture yesterday that many of us appreciated was the attempt at a clear definition of evangelicalism. But perhaps even more problematic is the term uh, fundamentalism. How has that changed in the course of this century? How has the term changed? When the term came into prominent use in the early part of this century, as far as I can see, it meant exactly the same as what I mean when I use the word evangelical today. Gradually, as the uh, term developed and as its popular, the popular conception of it developed in the American mind, it came to be thought of as a term of opprobrium. Partly, this was the plan of those who didn't like it, and those same people didn't like evangelicalism either. But uh, nonetheless, it was a sort of image that was conveyed, and uh, eventually the word fundamentalist very frequently means I don't like the person to whom I'm referring, or at least I don't like his theology. Now, there's a, there's a project now going on at the University of Chicago, isn't there, examining fundamentalism. And if I understand them correctly, they want to attach that label to any religious group that has a kind of infallible scripture somewhere, regardless of the group. It could be Muslim or, or whatever. Uh, how does that use of the term function in our society today? Well, I think it's a, it's a term that uh, Time and Newsweek have popularized. And, of course, uh, I deplore it because then it puts me in the same class with Khomeini, and uh, that doesn't, On the whole, doesn't sit well fit. with me, no, <laughs> no. The most, uh, the most sensible division between fundamentalism and evangelicalism that I can see is to say fundamentalism is a part of evangelicalism, but it's the part that tends to be more separatistic than the other part. Uh, you know, if in, a, in certain places, if a person asks me if I were a fundamentalist, I look at him to see how he asks it. <laughs> if, he, if he asks it by looking down his nose askance at me, I say, goodness, I can't be as bad as you think a fundamentalist must be. Uh, I don't have any horns on. But uh, if I'm asked by other people who I think want to know if I have a commitment to basic biblical doctrine, I say, well, yes, uh, I'm a fundamentalist. I always have been. I prefer the term evangelical, and I wish I could just use the term Christian. Thank you. I, I want to go back for a moment, Carl, to, um, to a period of enormous turmoil in this country, the period of the 60s. Um, what is your assessment of, of the pervasive culture of the 60s uh, not only the drug culture and the anti-authoritarian stances and the rebellion, uh, that sort of thing, but also the Jesus movement, the rise against racism and so forth. What was the, what was the effect of this uh, pervasive cultural movement on evangelical churches? It tended to orient the interest of the churches and of the Christian movement especially to an emphasis on experience. Now, experience is desperately important. Jesus left no doubt about it when he talked to a supreme educator in his own day and said that except a man be born again, he cannot participate in the kingdom of God. But this was now experience largely loosed from cognitive or conceptual controls. And it came at the expense of uh, the theological orientation of the Christian message. I would like to point out that when we speak of evangelicalism, 
in my mind, we are speaking of an ism, namely a set of beliefs. Biblical Christianity is more than a set of beliefs. Biblical Christianity refers to a relationship that we have to God. And moreover, uh, equally important, it refers to a way of life. And evangelicalism as a set of beliefs is a set of beliefs about that relationship and about that way of life, but biblical Christianity is all three, and all three are absolutely essential to it. How do you envisage yourself the impact of the pervasive subculture of the 60s on evangelicalism? In addition to what Carl has said in terms of focusing things on Christian experience, perhaps a, a, little, a little heavily on that side, do you see f further features uh, in that impact? Well, yes, one I see is a backing off from the ethical aspects and implications mm -hmm. that are an essential part of biblical Christianity. Uh, oftentimes, it was a case of selecting a few things that served as touch points by which you judged a person's uh, ethical status, whereas it uh, ought to be the whole implications of what our Lord said was bound up in love to God and love to our fellow human beings. And I think that that has really slipped in the minds of many evangelicals and is not as noticeable as it ought to be and as it has been at certain points in the history of biblical Christianity. Uh, was there not also in that period some concern about racism? Has that, has that made a good impact on, on, on the evangelical uh, movement or uh, ha has its uh, impact been deleterious as well? If by racism you mean the, uh, the uh, general uh, attitude in our society that this is unthinkable, then I think that that is one good thing that, uh, that we have uh, been pushed into in some cases. Now, actually, I think evangelicalism at its roots is just the antithesis of racism. If there's any mm -hmm. clear teaching in the Bible, it is that there is just one human race. And uh, yet it is, it is that biblical rootage of the oneness of the race that enables me to be confident that all human races really are the same. We are one race, and the rootage of the race in a single humanity is the thing that the scriptures make abundantly plain. So this is a part of the biblical and ethical implications of Christianity. Well, let me ask, if I may, two questions about the 70s before we come up to uh, our, our present period. What impact did the election of Jimmy Carter have on the public perception of where evangelicalism is? Everyone had to come to terms with the perception of Jimmy Carter as a born-again president. I traveled throughout Asia in those days and preached in many of the countries and the question is, what does this mean that uh, an American president is born again? Some countries, the background would be uh, uh, reincarnation. Uh, in uh, uh, other countries, uh, simple confusion. It was a golden opportunity to clarify what Christianity intended by the doctrine of the new birth. The remarkable thing was that uh, by 1976, uh, Newsweek took note of the fact that uh, all three presidential candidates claimed uh, to have a born-again experience. Uh, one of them, Gerald Ford, had a, a, a Episcopal roots, nonetheless had a son who went into the ministry, attended another evangelical seminary, and is presently an evangelical minister, Presbyterian, I believe, in Pittsburgh, and uh, uh, Ronald Reagan as well claimed to have a born-again experience. And uh, so uh, the remarkable fact was that the evangelical movement had so, uh, had become of such political significance uh, as a movement with moral concerns in the American arena that it was now not looked on simply as an oddity, but something that uh, 
uh, should be uh, taken seriously, uh, whether uh, all of its approaches were uh, uh, respected as the ideal approach or not, uh, whether it should be viewed as more confrontational than a contribution to democratic consensus. Those were other questions, but nevertheless something happened that had brought uh, the uh, uh, evangelical movement into the public arena with the conviction that no candidate for the president could possibly be elected going into the future without its enthusiasm. So that at least we were being discussed. That's right. Yes. Now internal to the movement, about the same time there erupted the battle for the Bible. Why? That again is a complex question. And there's no simple answer, but probably the root answer was in the direction, lies in the direction, of an attempt to, uh, to get along and get a hearing. Because the overall structure in our society is slanted against it. And that became a sort of dividing line. And if you stood for that, you were to some degrees in uh, theological circles an oddity. And many wanted not to be that because they wanted desperately to be heard. If you want to put it in my terms, it was their evangelistic enthusiasm that led them to uh, slough off that obstacle to securing a hearing. That's part of it. Another part is that we had no graduate schools. In fact, we had no uh, a large group of evangelicals in our colleges. Where in the world could young growing up in that day get a solid rooting on an intellectual level of what the Christian faith demanded. In their homes, unfortunately, they weren't able to get it. Their parents weren't qualified. Sunday school just didn't do it. If you ever have any doubts, someday you should take a look at a text in any high school science and then use the Sunday school, take a look at the literature used in Sunday school for upper class high school students, and you'll see a vast difference in the level at which they deal with problems of the mind. But they had no place to learn. And so going through our public schools for 12 years, four years of a liberal college or a state university, and, and four years of graduate work, perhaps, in their discipline, they never had the possibilities of making the integration. So are you saying that there really was declension in the movement that needed to be addressed? Yes, it was a, an inadequate preparation and in, an inadequate intellectual, educational care of our young people. Now, while we're still on this question of, of biblical authority, um, quite a number of recent historians, uh, George Marsden and quite a lot of others, have uh, argued in many learned articles and books that uh, the present concern of evangelicalism for a view of the truthfulness of scripture that is often associated with the term infallibility or the term inerrancy really was a mistake introduced at the end of the 19th century by Benjamin Warfield and others and that it was parasitic on uh, a philosophical structure, common sense realism, it, it was far too dependent upon it. Uh, how would you assess that historical judgment? I would say it's a complete misreading of history. You go back into the ancient world, they may have had problems, for me, with their understanding of Scripture, but it's because they had a too rigorous a view of the inspiration of Scripture, something that may have come a little too close to dictation to leave me comfortable. You go to Augustine, he spells out his view. He and Jerome carried on a long correspondence that we, can, we have extant in which they discussed the problems of inerrant scripture. Uh, Thomas Aquinas did the same. Uh, Luther clearly committed himself to inerrancy and to the, to the view that Augustine had enunciated before him. There may be wrinkles there that if we had time we could explore, like what he said about the book of James, but there's no question that if a book is a part of scripture, it's truthful. Uh, 
Calvin felt so strongly about this that one of the original charges against Servetus was that he thought there was a geographical error in the scripture. And you can go on down through, uh, through history. Uh, they, the German Lutherans never heard of Scottish realism, but they are amongst the most staunch defenders of inerrancy. It's just a complete wrong misleading of history. I, I really wish you'd make yourself clear on this point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Carl, um, because you've been associated in the public mind uh, uh, with evangelicalism and you've really had a, a global ministry and have touched so many people in different denominational traditions and so on, not everybody is aware that uh, by ordination you're a Baptist. Um, so if you will don that hat for a moment, um, would you be so kind as to give us your frank assessment of what is going on in the Southern Baptist Convention? and its relevance to evangelicalism. The Southern Baptist Convention has come upon hard times, but I think is, it is seeing light at the end of the tunnel. There is no question but that the, the constituency, the lay people in the churches, are overwhelmingly conservative in their theology and in their commitments and that uh, the doctrine of the full truthfulness of Scripture would be taken as normative by them, as their own commitment. This has not been true of numbers of the professors in the seminaries in recent years, and in some of the, uh, the denominational, leading denominational positions. And, and those who have rejected inerrancy call themselves moderates, and call those who accept inerrancy fundamentalists, battling fundamentalists, really. The modernists, I think it is fair to say, have no consensus except their objection to the inerrancy commitment of the fundamentalists. Let me say that again because I think it's important. The modernist span does not reflect a, uh, a, uh, an, a shared body of uh, basic doctrines. It can incorporate all variety of departure from historic Christianity, though by and large that departure would be less pronounced than it would be at some of the large university-related divinity schools in the, in the Northeast. So they know more what they're against than what they're for. That's right. That's exactly right. So uh, the uh, the trustees have in recent years taken more seriously the uh, responsibilities that they have for the direction of the schools and uh, there have been, the schools have been moving in a conservative direction and I think looking down the line another three to five years the Southern Baptist uh, seminaries and agencies will be much more conformed to what the convention has been historically and what it still is in actual fact numerically so far as the members of the mm. churches by and large are. If you would let me speak further than I'm Of course. Uh, the Missouri Synod Lutherans have done somewhat of a similar change. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, expand the horizons even further now, if I may, beyond um, uh, uh, American evangelicalism entirely. Both of you have had extensive influence abroad in one fashion or another. How do you see the way American evangelicalism fits into the worldwide movement, into evangelicalism, basic biblical Christianity around the world? If you would both speak to that briefly, perhaps Carl first. There has been, before the turn of the century, an evangelical movement in England. Also, I believe in Germany, if not just before the turn of the century, at least after. That, uh, that uh, ecumenical movement included, uh, or evangelical movement, was really quite ecumenical. It was pre-ecumenical in terms of the modern ecumenical yes. movement, Federal Council, National Council, World Council of Churches. These were late comers. And the remarkable fact is that uh, there was more uh, unanimity uh, in Britain, for example, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, British Evangelical Alliance, 
uh, before the rise of the modern pluralistic ecumenical movement than there has been since. The, the uh, pluralistic ecumenical movement, the World Council of Churches, has more divisions in it than, than ever existed. Mm -hmm. There's a World Lutheran body and a World Methodist body and all of them within the one mm -hmm. ecumenical movement. Mm -hmm. Now, our, our time is just about gone on this first segment. Let me ask you the same question. How do you see the place of American evangelicalism in the global movement as well? Evangelicalism has always been an evangelistic uh, movement. And so the mission fields of the world tend much, much more to be thoroughly evangelical than any of the mother churches back here. Unfortunately, they too have been hit by liberalism or modernism, as Dr. Henry prefers to call it. And part of that is because we haven't provided the educated leadership for those who are the leaders in the so-called third or two-thirds world. And so they may be raised, reared in their, in their mission churches, thoroughly evangelical, and come back here and become liberal. An outstanding example of that is uh, Mabiti, an African theologian. John Mabiti. Hmm. Who was reared in a mission church, went through mission schools, came back to Providence, Rhode Island Bible College and studied here, and then after that went on to graduate school, but he had had no graduate training from an evangelical viewpoint at all. His serious graduate theological training was all in liberal schools, and he turned liberal, and now he's trying to show that the ancient African religions are really the Old Testament for an African convert of today. So do you see a role then for evangelicalism to help train leaders in this regard now? Not just a role, but a terrible responsibility. And an urgent need. Absolutely. Well, we must uh, end our first segment here. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you, Carl and uh, Kenneth, for sharing your expertise with us. In the last segment, we shall come back and spend a little more time, especially probing into the future of the movement, where we go from here, the pitfalls ahead of us, the dangers, the opportunities. Uh, join us for the last segment of discussion. <laughs>